Our next speaker is Terry Holliday, superintendent of Iredell Statesville Schools. We also heard from Terry on Monday morning. Please welcome Terry Holliday. Thank you so much for staying a little while longer this morning. Uh, I know that uh, planes are waiting and people need to get back to the office. Um, I would like to thank one more time uh, NIST and ASQ and ASTD staff. Uh, they've shown us that they don't only just talk about quality, they've run a quality uh, conference here. And all I know is it's so quality I probably gained about two pounds. How about you guys? <laughs> Uh, those little slushy things, they, boy, I'm going to have to take that back with me. Those are great. Uh, I want to thank you for making our team feel, feel important. Uh, school people quite often uh, go through life, uh, uh, they don't get a lot of pay, they don't get a lot of recognition, but they're out there dealing with our most important uh, natural resource, our children. So if you would, let, give, give my team one more hand. What a wonderful team they are. You, you come here for a transformational experience, and we hope our team has been part of your transformational experience. We hope we've helped you transform the way you speak into a little more Southern. We hope you've, <laughs> we hope you've moved from you guys to you all to y'all, okay? <laughs> we hope you've moved from Iredale to Iredale to just Iredell, okay? <laughs> so when you come to Charlotte, uh, you can say to people and they'll understand you, where is Iredell? But now for the big question of the day, who's going to be booted off American Idol tonight? <laughs> All right, so we've gotten started. Just a little bit about our background uh, of our school system. Um, I was reading um, a website in uh, 2000, 2001, I can't remember uh, too much, and there was a story on the news about a local school superintendent that was being fired in Statesville, North Carolina. And what was amazing to me is the web was really taking off at that time, and the school board uh, was in the a lengthy trial, I think the thing went about six months. Uh, they had 70 findings of fact, and in their effort to be transparent, they had put all 70 findings of fact on their web page for everyone to see as to why they had uh, released the superintendent for basically physical mismanagement. Um, I told one of my friends, I said, that might be an interesting job. And he said, well, you're crazy. And I said, well, that's been told to me before. Uh, but I said, they only got one way to go. So, you know. It was a great, what I found was um, the, the, the whole thing, the turmoil of the trial, and it was, he was a good superintendent. He had a lot of great ideas, a lot of innovation, and was going the right direction. He just, you know, made some dumb mistakes, like uh, Simon talked about early on, leadership and evaluation and just making some bad decisions and, and trying to hide some of those decisions. You just, you just can't do that in the climate we're in today. And the student achievement wasn't where it needed to be. It was in the bottom third in North Carolina. And basically, the school board had taken a wonderful trip to San Diego and on a credit card had done Disney and all this stuff. A bar bill, I think, was about $1,500. So uh, they didn't stay at the Ritz-Carlton, but they stayed close. Um, <laughs> so we came into a, a situation with a team uh, that had low trust and, and teachers just really distrusted the central office. Uh, they didn't want to see us and they didn't believe anything we said. And it was that classic uh, conflict between us. But they were great teachers. There was a wonderful staff and a great central office staff and it was an exciting group of people to work with. And I remember uh, some of the early board meetings when they were hiring me, uh, the, the key thing was uh, uh, we seemed to have a plan. The, the Board of Education liked it because we had a plan, and that plan, it was just Baldridge, uh, you know. They, had, they said, what is that? And I said, well, I think it's the Baldridge criteria, but we, we probably don't want to use that word. 
uh, because I'd used that word in a previous school system, we'd gone from um, kind of middle of the pack to one of the top two school systems in North Carolina. And when you use the word, sometimes I think there's a, a little hidden teacher network out there that anytime the baldish word pops up, they all email each other and say, watch out for that. So I, I don't know if y'all have that problem. I don't know if that happens in healthcare, um, but what we're trying to do is, is, is keep the focus on the children and keep the focus on learning. And that's where the conflicts kind of started. It was great to have a top 10 vision that we wanted to be a top 10 system measured by learning outcomes because it, it wasn't about being top 10, it was about if we did get more children learning to higher levels, then top 10 would just naturally happen. So the clash began. You've got the beliefs of an existing culture. And all of you out there that are on this journey, you know this clash. You know when it starts happening. In education, the way it happens, teachers just pick up the phone and call school board members. Say, who is this crazy superintendent y'all got now? I, I like what he said the first week, but then he actually wants us to do something. He wants us to change something. He wants us to be a little bit more focused on the children. Well, you know my job's to teach and their job is to learn and I'm not supposed to worry about if they're learning or not. I'm just supposed to worry about if we're teaching or not. And you know, most systems, uh, education is probably one of the worst, but we believe in stories. We believe in status quo. Well, you know, it's been like that for a hundred years. We've done cemetery teaching for a hundred years. Kids sit in rows and they stay quiet. <laughs> what do you mean I'm supposed to get these kids engaged and collaborative and, and working together? So the clash was on and, you know, innovation. What do you mean we're gonna let kids have uh, cell phones? Well, they might be a good learning tool. Did you ever think? about our children. You know what happens to our kids when they come to school every day? We call it the power down effect. They have to power down. All of you have uh, or know children in, in this age, say, you know, 15 to, to late teens to early 20s. I, I was thinking about my daughter the other night sitting there on the, on the sofa. She's working on her uh, computer. She's got a little texting going on over here on the side, uh, watching TV, and she's got her iPod in the other ear. <laughs> and I'm lucky just to try to stay tuned to the TV and not fall asleep. <laughs> and I think about that, and, and she's in college now, but when she was in high school, it, it was always the same thing, you know, just come in and let's power down. Let's go from the the wealth of this world in technology to a 90 minute lecture on a high school block schedule. So our kids have to power down when they come to school. So what we tried to do is in our Baldrige journey, we tried to move everybody forward to really focus on this passion and commitment for learning and it would lead us into a great change process. And what I tell everybody about the Baldrige criteria, uh, it, it's the same, you'll hear it from everybody. Guys, this isn't an add-on, this is just the way you ought to do work. And with education, the, our only key to get educators moving forward with using the Baldrige criteria is, is to get them to understand that if you use the criteria for what it's intended, a good blueprint, a good framework, uh, you know, a measure on a national, world, international standards level, it'll help you improve the learning of all children. I guess what really drives this, every time I get in a little bit of trouble, which is quite often, um, it seems like Ron and I have that in common, I, I don't know. But anyway, we get in a lot of trouble sometimes for saying the wrong things at the wrong time to the wrong people. I always have to go back to this quote, and I'm going to show you a quote from Ed Deming on the next slide that talks about all children come to school with a yearning for learning, and our aim should be to increase the positives and decrease the negatives so that those children keep their yearning for learning. Here's what happens, and I told you a little bit about this the other day, but it's worth repeating. 
if you don't believe this quote and if you don't believe this happens in schools, just visit those kindergarten classrooms and see what a yearning for learning every child has at the beginning. Kind of walk it through, kind of spot check third grade and you begin to see the shoulders start to drop. Then you go to middle school and you see the bullying and intimidating taking place. And then you go to high school and you see kids who have to power down when they go to class and their sole purpose in life is just to survive another class. Now there are exceptions to that rule everywhere and we're trying to make more exceptions to that rule in our school system. But this is the thing we have to do. All of those children start out wanting to be successful. What is it we do to them between kindergarten and when they drop out of school that uh, made them not feel successful? So we focus on that passion for learning and that always gets me out of trouble because that's a hard one to, to battle with. Like, well, you know, you may not like what the school system's doing, you may not like what the school board wants you to do, but you know, they really have one thing in mind, and that's the kids and helping the kids learn. So, a key belief in our system is about the level above enabling the level below. If children aren't learning to high levels in every classroom, it's because we have a teaching-centered classroom. Now, it is not the teacher that's the issue, it's the classroom's learning system. So we need to help the teacher improve. I truly believe 95 to 98% of our teachers are wonderful and they're gonna do a great job. They just need help learning what to do to help more children learn. So how do you enable teachers to create learning-centered classrooms? Well, principals have to create a learning-centered school. You gotta make decisions about what's best for children and learning rather than, well, this teacher's been here 25 years, so she deserves the honors class. We got to have this schedule uh, because we've always had the schedule this way and teachers have always had 50 minutes of planning at this school. You can't make decisions based on the adults. You've got to make decisions on the children in front of you each day. Principals, if they're not creating learning-centered schools, it's because your school system and your school board and your superintendent are still creating an adult-focused system. They've got to create a learning-focused system where the number one belief is that all children can learn, all teachers can help children learn, and all principals can help all teachers help children learn. So the level above always enables the level below. So a little bit more about our belief systems. If we believe that our, our issue is to decrease the failures for the kids, where, where do we lose teachers? I haven't met one teacher yet coming out of college that wasn't excited about finally getting that first teaching position. And then you go a year or two later, five years later, 10 years later, do they still have that passion for teaching and helping kids learn? If they don't, it could be our fault as the system. What do we need to do better to help our, ch our teachers keep that passion for learning and then give it to the kids? and keep the kids' passion for learning. It's, it's tough work. It's tough work out there because uh, hardly a day goes by that public education isn't beaten up somewhere. I'm sure somewhere somebody's going to figure out that the current global recession is due to public education. I just, I, I was waiting on Simon to say it, but he, he didn't say it this morning. All right, so as we started our Baldry's journey, um, key word there was uh, don't, don't throw the criteria at people and say read the criteria and do it. What you want to do is start them uh, with small actions that lead to successes and you try to repeat those, uh, those behaviors. When we started the journey we were asking three questions. We, we came in and no big changes early on, went out and wanted to ask three basic questions and here they are. No, no big deal. We went out very low key, very low tech, very low cost. What we did is we put up uh, three uh, posters on, uh, on the wall in the faculty gathering rooms uh, and we asked questions. What's getting in the way of, the, of helping the kids learn? 
and what do you need to help the kids learn to high levels? And then what do you expect from a superintendent? So question one was uh, what's getting in the way of student learning. What we did there is that sh began to change the culture because the question wasn't, uh, you know, first what you need. The question first was what's getting in the way of helping more children learn. So we focused right away on the mission and vision of our organization. Second question was all about what do you need to help these children be more successful. What we found out is uh, mainly they were talking about external issues. It was always someone else's fault or someone else or something else that they needed other than, well, we need to change our teaching or our learning uh, processes. But the big thing for me was what's, what you expect from superintendent because it had been such a confrontational issue between superintendent and teachers that we needed to find out what they wanted. And what they want is what Ron, what Simon, what everybody said so far. They want you visible. They want you communicating. They wanted me to attend ball games. They wanted me to come into classrooms. They wanted me to communicate honestly and openly. Don't try to put a spin on it. Just give them the facts and tell them what you needed them to do. And if they sensed you were honest and open, teachers will move mountains for you. So what we did find out is um, they said school attendance was a big issue. They had some of the worst attendance in the, in the state. And they said, if we could get the kids to school, we could do a lot better job with them. So we started modeling right there. We didn't call it a PDSA. We just put together a PDSA team and started working on our attendance. We used these uh, issue bin, affinity charts. Like we used tools, and nobody knew they were tools. All of a sudden, we had a plan. We had a deployment plan to address attendance. We went from having one of the worst attendance uh, in the state to the uh, second year, we worked on this. We had state average or better. And then the third year, we reached uh, top five in North Carolina with student attendance percentages, and we've held on to it. The sustainability of our attendance PDSA, we've held on, and uh, on average, we rank in the top three over the last five, uh, four years. So what did we learn from our early journeys? Well, I think what we learned is when you go in and you ask people, we're not getting too good of results. What do we need to get better results? It's always someone else's fault. We call it the blame game. You know, the college professors say if the high schools would just send us a little better prepared students, we'd do much better work with these kids. The high school teachers say, well, it's the middle school teachers. If they would just better prepare them, we, we'd do a much better job. The middle school teachers blame it on the elementary teachers and say, if they just teach them to read, we could do a lot better job. Elementary teachers blame it on the parents and say, you know, if they just get them ready for school and uh, the mama blames it on the daddy, says his family's always been like that. They, they've been, <laughs> they get new. And then the daddy blames it on the mama, says, well, the little thing probably isn't mine to begin with. So. Um, I, for those of you that know Brenda Clark, I first learned that from Brenda, so I take no credit for that one. All right. Um, but what we learned is uh, we don't have enough computers. We don't have enough of time. We don't have enough of paper. We don't, it's always external to a uh, system. And complacency was always there. And no sense of urgency. These kids don't need Algebra One. They're not going to college. Uh, my job's to teach, their job's to learn. If they wanted to learn, they'd be learning. You know, there's nothing gonna change here. You know, this is the way it's been happening for 50 or 60 years. Problem was, in our community, the kids used to go to work in the textile mills or the furniture factories. Those jobs don't even exist anymore, not in our country, and they certainly wouldn't pay uh, what they are, uh, uh, were used to getting paid. But what we, uh, what we did learn, what we did learn is something very important, is this resistance, it, is always going to be there. Someone asked me for this quote, and it, you can download this afterwards. But in education, these folks, uh, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. They guard the past. They constantly guard the past, and they guard the status quo. And like I told you the other day, they guard the status quo because everybody's an expert in education. They went to school. 
So what does not work is we learn that uh, facts alone won't work. You can't just give the numbers. You've got to put people and faces to numbers. Fear doesn't work. You, you can't hold a gun to people's head. You can't force them into this stuff either. No child left behind has tried to force us into things by just labeling us as failures uh, based on a one-day, one-time test or one subgroup that doesn't meet it. That hadn't worked, so we've got to try something else. But what we have found in, through our Baldry's journey, what we did find that does work is relationships. You've got to build relationships with your people. And I, what I sense in the leaders that are presented is there's wonderful relationships. You're getting out there, whether you're out there in an Easter Bunny outfit or a Santa Claus outfit. I've got an elementary principal. He wears a costume about once a week. Uh, so it, it's great you build relationships we build relationships by going out and visiting and the walk arounds and the communications with our staff so you've got to have those race relationships and you just got to start small and you just got to keep well let's do this it's got to be the way that you do the work and eventually you'll get, get around to reframing beliefs the great book there I told you about that my wife gave me on Valentine's Day a couple of years ago was uh, Change or Die. So read that book. I'd recommend it. It could really change your life and it could really change the way you uh, work. The biggest thing in education is changing beliefs, though. The Pygmalion effect is the, the key issue. And if we believe that we can make a difference in children's lives, we will. If we believe we can impact student learning, we will. There is no bell curve. It does not exist. All children can learn to high levels on a standards-based educational system. If we do not think our actions can make a